So, uh, welcome to the general discussion bit of our today's symposium on music and Islam. Uh, we've had some, some talks here, you, you see, see most of the presenters here, and, and now they are also supplemented by Murat Ermutlu from the band Nefes. And also, John Miller is, is playing in the band, so that they have this. Well, John already talked about the experiential part of, of being, being here, or non, non, being, non, non being here. And, uh, and I'm still, still trying, trying to uh, grasp with those ideas. But anyway, so my name is Antti Villekarja. Um, and the idea here is, well, I used in the program the word fishbowl, which means, which I, I just learned one time during my trips that apparently one of these, these innovative ways of doing these discussions is having a, a ring of chairs like a fi in a fishbowl a constellation and people can, can come in then there and, and I don't know if, if, if the goldfish in the bowls really escape never or ever their, their conditions, but still the idea was that people could come in and, and sort of give their ideas and then maybe then then go back to their seats and so forth and, and it would be this kind of uh, interactive or, or livelier form of, of doing this discussion but maybe we'll just stick with stick with this 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 uh, uh, crescent shape that we have here now and as you notice like it was already mentioned in the in the, in the, in the seminar that we do have an all male panel I in a sense do apologize for that but it was not entirely of my own making or the, the, the the, the, the kind of a deliberate idea behind this. Uh, I'm very conscious about those things and, and, and just made me wonder during the pre pre preparations of this, this symposium that why the all, all the submissions that I got and, and the people who were kind of willing to, to, to submit their papers were male. What does this tell us about the, the, the question of, of music and Islam? Because it happens to vice versa sometimes when I've, I've gone to the, the, the let's say, a symposium where you talk about music and education. Most of the speakers are female there. So that there's, there's something in the topic sometimes that sort of are maybe conditioned in ways that we, we do not know. And then, of course, when talking about religious issues, there's this heavy, heavy baggage sometimes with the kind of a patri patriarchal uh, uh, authority uh, systems and structures there that we cannot ex escape even if we wanted to, and, and it takes time to, to go beyond those. That's not our aim here. This is this is what just happened. This is a real life event. We were talking about uh, how, when dealing with music and Islam, and then maybe music and Islam in more general, not always together, but as separate spheres also, that we need to be very careful about the the conditions and the context that was repeatedly brought up in the discussion, I, I would say that, that there, there's, there, it's one thing to talk about the kind of a theological and ideological prepositions and, and, and that kind of a debate, but maybe what we are doing here is more uh, uh, about the kind of a real life circumstances, the reality, as one of the presenters put it, uh, of, 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 of the world and how we can make then sense uh, out of those situations, how, how we can maybe understand the world a bit better and, and, and direct our actions upon that. And uh, um, uh, so, well, I guess we, we didn't really solve the, solve the puzzle if, if there ever was one about what, what, what's at stake with music and Islam. We were, we, were, we were saying that, well, we had examples from Turkey, and Nero was talking about the different different aspects, uh, different dimensions, different tensions or, or dynamics between the global or global and local and then as a consequence local aspects of, of Turkish popular music and how, how, how we can, we can uh, separate different, different spheres from there. And then we had a um, uh, uh, presentation where we were talking about, oh, when I was, I was thinking about this in terms of what I maybe uh, was reminded again was the importance of of the the Islamic tradition and then the kind of a theoretical uh, and also the philosophical uh, discussion that's been there uh, since for or at least for hundreds and maybe thousands of years or well, not thousands but but still hundreds of years and in terms of well in relation to my background which is the, the kind of a um, European dominated uh, Western uh, uh, modernist or modern era uh, music research and the music theorization 
that how much actually has been done before that in the sphere of, of the study and, and, and the kind of a philosophical inquiry into Arabic culture in, within and, and in relation to music especially. So that that's one area that I would say that to think about music and Islam is also to recognize this kind of a, uh, 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 intellectual history that exists there. And, 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 and it was brought out that there's yet another tome of, 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 of writings from, from the 9th or 10th century that, that could teach us new things about how we perceive music in the Western world as well. So that this whole idea, whether or not, it's like, I would say in some ways, that there are certain similarities here in terms of how uh, the history of blackness has been treated in, 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 in modern uh, uh, social sciences and that kind of inescapable part of the, the, the whole constellation that, that is <coughs> conceived as the Western world, that we cannot conceive the Western world without these, this kind of a, well, the most, I wouldn't say the negative way to put it, is, but, but still that there are these kind of counterparts or, or, or certain parts that need to be, uh, that, are, that are as constitutive as the, the so-called or the alleged European slash Western identity for, for what it means to be a Western person and, and live in a Western society. And in that sense, it was a reminder for me at least that the Islamic culture, Islamic music, uh, it needs to be recognized as one of those, whether or not it's as it, as it tends to be sometimes and quite often it tends to be framed as the kind of a negative uh, 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 mirror and, and the, the other of the Western. But, but try to think of that in terms of how this uh, uh, sphere of activity, the intellectual history that exists there, actually is a very constitutive part of, of what we are in, in, in Finland also in, in this time and age. Um, and then there was another thing that, that struck me during the, 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 the presentations. There was also this, this um, thing that when, when we are talking about music and Islam, we don't have necessarily to talk about Muslim musicians alone, but we can also talk about this in terms of how the Muslim identity or Muslimness in, in the kind of very abstract way is used also by those who are not Muslim or do not uh, 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 subscribe or, 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 or identify themselves as, as Muslims or, or in, in any way. Oh, well, I wouldn't say in any way, but still, and, and it doesn't mean also that we have to um, uh, think about those issues uh, or situations where there is a kind of a antagonist aspect to, to Muslim identity, but, but just, just the kind of our everyday discourse of, of, of Muslimness, how, how that is uh, constructed and, and maintained and, and, and operated in the, in the kind of a, a broader scheme of things. That was one, one thing that I, I got from today. But um, yeah, we were... What should we do now, actually? I was, I was <laughs> thinking, thinking about this, that we talk about maybe maybe um, if there are any questions in the audience uh, or any ideas and, 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 and uh, uh, ideas that, that, or topics that you would raise up here, you feel welcome to do so, raise your hand and I'll, I'll bring the microphone over to you. But I was actually now, maybe, maybe because we have a new member amongst us, so I was, I was inclined to ask Murat here as a member of Nefes and, 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 and as a kind of a prelude to the concert tonight, to, to maybe keep, say a few words about how you, uh, and, and of course John as, as the member of the band, you might also want to join there, but how do you see, what is the, 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 the kind of uh, importance or significance and, and, the, and the specificness or how, whateverness uh, of Islam in the, in, the, in the music that we are about to hear in an hour or so? So that would be my kind of first idea, because that, that sort of ties up these things, and maybe maybe also there's some some issues that then then link to what what we discussed earlier today. But you went there, so so it it, it will be news for us in any. Okay, is it on? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So my name is Borat Armut. I have uh, I'm an engineer, and uh, and I discover. Actually, I, I, I'm a believer, but I, I don't practice religion. 
and uh, but uh, the the way my path went to this way that is is like I like music and rhythms and then uh, once upon a time when there's a dervish came to to Finland I also learned their music by listening and uh, one of the guy was always telling something in this Sufi dervishes, they always put things in this different perspective. So it took my attention and I start to read and look for it and then I try to learn myself. And in, in the end I discovered that uh, what, I do, what I will do tonight here, it's like for me uh, praying, so practicing my religion. And. Uh, <clears throat> That's all about, so I, when I play, not like only the religion music, of course, the, any, any music that I connect to the world and, and, and I, I feel happy. And uh, that's all about, I think, also in, in my belief of religion, that, uh, that you have to connect the world and then be happy and uh, joyfully, and then also help the others to feel the joy and then make, make the world heaven, that's, that's all. And then uh, one of the ways, you know, you just lose yourself in, uh, and then when you're playing, sometimes that uh, I go somewhere else and come back. It's happened when you read or watch a movie or look at your kid playing, it could be anywhere. When uh, the spring comes, you get you get the flower. It's it's all the same. I mean, it's the feeling comes to you, and then and then you feel connected. Tonight we have uh, this is my story, of course. But tonight we try to uh, push the limits for fundamental uh, way of thinking a little bit. So <laughs> don't be surprised, or uh, if it will be in YouTube, so somebody will maybe say something bad about it also, but anyway, this is what we do, and we love it. And we have friends from uh, Senegal and Ghana, and this is all rhythm section, and also they dance, uh, one of them dancing actually, and we show what the Senegalese, uh, uh, when you say religious music, what they sing actually. So it is, uh, for me, it was also a learning process because I didn't know that how they practice or make music. And in, in, in my, uh, or let's say, in my experience that the things we sing, I try to understand because it is all the words, very important. Also the music, but the words is very important. And uh, so we try to show uh, some classical piece, like you have the classical pieces in, in uh, Christianity and you don't uh, separate them, are they religious music or a classical music? It's the same for us. So, and uh, some Mevlevi music, whirling dervishes, and uh, one of the great po poem, poem, poets, uh, Yunus Emre's pieces, and uh, one, one is uh, composed by a young guy, like, now, I, I think it's not young anymore, about 40 now, I think. It's a young man. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so we have like very old music and uh, very old uh, poems composed by the new composers. So these things also touch still, and we have a uh, very old, uh, one of the oldest, I think, Islamic, uh, song is, is uh, Rane will sing tonight that it is like when Mohammed reached to Medina and uh, I think Ersan or somebody start to chant to welcome him to Medina so it's the first first one ever or this is one of the first yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it is like they welcome and they wish his good peace and so it's we have that one, also we have new stuff, we have uh, Sunni stuff, we have Shi stuff, we have Alevi stuff, so it's like, 
we try to give uh, some perspective, but uh, all the instruments, and you will see a lot of drumming, and, and, and it is fun. Uh, and Buziki, yes. <laughs> Our great uh, enemy, uh, enemy's uh, instruments, uh, great instruments. We love them. So it's very, very, it's a few kind of fusion, I think. So we will be a little bit mixed stuff for tonight, but it is, uh, I don't know, I hope you like it and uh, enjoy it. Right? Uh, I actually realized that I've been a very poor host here. I didn't introduce the, the, the people who are here, uh, so, so let me do it now. So we have Jonas Otterbeck here from Sweden, Mladar uh, John Miller, Mikko Vidameki, and Ayhan Erol from Turkey. And, um, um, yes, so they were, they were most of them, all, except for Murat, they were, they were presenting today at the, at, the, at the symposium. But uh, yes, thank you for this. Uh, excited and, and waiting for that uh, enthusiastic. Uh, uh, one thing, maybe we, we, there was, we didn't talk too much about this, I think, in the, in the symposium today, but one of the questions that, that's uh, sort of what, what I, I seem to be thinking most, well, often, I would say, not most often, but often, uh, is the question of denominations here, that, that you were saying that you are bringing out different different aspects, Sufi, Shia, Sunni, Alevi, so forth, and then, then but still, I'm not quite sure, but um, did we today, did we talk mainly about Sufi uh, aspects in, 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 the, in the symposium? Uh, what would be the, the then, and, and in, in, if you think, if in, in terms of the literature that, that I've, I've, I've encountered, there is a certain certain kind of a, uh, in terms of, of maybe if, if this is a, it depends on the on the on the kind of legal framework or the, the Sharia interpretations that are we immediately drawn into the Sufi realm rather than the other realms when we talk about music and Islam and, and is there, well. Would you, is this true, first of all? And, and if it's true, is there something that we should do about that? Uh -huh. Am I wrong? Or Okay. <laughs> no, uh, some of us were talking about Sufism, but uh, not all the time. And uh, the groups that I was talking about are rather Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, some other reference that I made to popular music was actually both Shia and Sunni radical uh, with Hezbollah and uh, Hamas, which produce quite a lot of, of popular music. Uh, in fact, it's so systemized that uh, Hezbollah has a, a department called Risalat, which is basically, a, if we could use ministry, it will be a cultural ministry or art ministry where they have uh, professional musicians employed, they own a studio, they have uh, several bands on the payroll, as uh, Hamas does. Hamas even have uh, a Lebanese-placed uh, all-female band, for example. Um, and, it, and it's connected with the development where uh, the idea of art and the idea that religion can use art was formulated in Islamic movements in the beginning of the 80s. And before that, they had sort of taken a stance against it. And uh, one of the, the key actors were actually the Iranian Revolution and what came out of that. Uh, first taking a stand against art, but very soon appropriating the idea of using art in its own way to promote its own ideals, which affected uh, has been up a lot. So then there are different developments uh, and different genres. And if you go to traditional music, yeah, then, then we were talking quite a lot. I mean, you were mentioning Sufi music, for example. You were mentioning Sufi music. And uh, some Yusuf, who were part of the movement that I was talking about, uh, left it for Sufi music. So that's important, of course. <laughs> uh, 
I think Sufi music in Turkey <coughs> is being uh, recognized as uh, outside of the mosque music, as a religious music. The mosque music, uh, I mean, uh, when I present my paper, I try to uh, indicate that uh, uh, religious music uh, is a part of the traditional Turkish art music. Traditional Turkish art music uh, could be divided into two categories. The first one, uh, secular music. The second one is uh, religious music. Religious music can be uh, also divided into two categories. The first one, the mosque music. The other one, Sufi music. So, Sufi music uh, recognizes uh, as the, uh, the outside of the mosque, but there is, uh, throughout the history, there is very strong relationship with each other. And also, I think that you can also uh, use any non-Sufi uh, musical uh, uh, piece as a, you can use uh, as a uh, Sufi music. For instance, uh, you're gonna perform the Tala Bedouin in your concert. Uh, when I was present my paper, uh, Muslims uh, believe that I said so. Uh, I uh, made a correction uh, according to this imagination. It was imagination because Tala Bedouin as a melody is very new created uh, melody. As far as I know, uh, uh, Egyptian composer uh, Sumbati composed this uh, a big uh, uh, song for the Egyptian diva Ümmü Kulsum. Talal Bedru Aleyna, a short piece of the, uh, the big uh, composition. So, uh, I think uh, in the 1972, for uh, it it has 40 years life or 50 years life, but many Muslims imagined this melody uh, coming from the during of the uh, Prophet Muhammad period. It's not. So maybe I can say something about it when you talk about the when you talk about music and Islam and you end up with Sufism. I think there are two categories in this discourse that we have to uh, make distinct. First is that you know uh, music in the religious frame of reference, and in that because the, at least in India the Sufis have been those who have been aestheticizing the religion. They have been the one who's input in uh, taking arts inside religion and using art as a generator of religious experience has been so uh, great in India that for that reason when you start talking about Islam and music in India in the religious frame of reference, you end up in the Sufi shrines, which were one of the, especially in the pre-modern times, the major centers of musical patronage in addition to the court, because then you have the other discourse, Muslims making music, which is not necessarily religious music. And, uh, for example, in the courts, uh, we, in Indian art music, there is the, the most archaic genre that is still uh, sang in the present day world, is Trubad, of which last Thursday you would have heard the great concert by Wasifuddin Dagar in Kauniast and Musiki Yuhlat and uh, the greatest exponent of Drupad. And that was a musical form that developed in the court context, in the Mughal court. Um, the performers have been Muslims. The main dynasty, uh, the families where this music has been transmitted. And often also Sufis listen to this music also in their circles. However, the very interesting thing is that the whole theory, musical theory behind Drubad is based very much on the Indian yogic perceptions of sound, what is sound. And many of the lyrics in Drubad music, sang by Muslims, they are dedicated to Hindu gods, like Shiva and Krishna. And then here also, 
this is very ambivalent music. It uh, employs the Hindu uh, theory, mystical theory of sound, uh, lyrics praising Hindu gods. It is performed by Muslim musicians, both in the secular context of court, nowadays of course the concert stages, and in the Sufi contexts of uh, Sufi shrines. So it's also the, when we have a general title like music and Islam, it somehow leaves the doors to open to us also to we analyze music in the religious framework, religious genres of music, or do we see the music making by Muslims, which I think would have, has come also out today, that it's very ambivalent, even the, what is pop music, for example, how much it is Islamic and uh, how much it is part of this, perhaps, Islam, Islam, Islamized but secular consum, 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 consumerism. So we end up in a rather wide field here. And, yeah, any more comments? Yeah, okay. so, yeah well, and I would say that, uh, that intentionally so, uh, in the wide field of, of, of the, the, the discussion. I was just, yeah, there was this one thing, or, well, it, I think that it was brought up in, in several of the presentations, uh, perhaps in a way all of them, and it's the question of, 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 of this, um, well, it's, it's partially in the in kind of very concrete sense, it's about labeling. And then uh, it's, about, it's about how, what kind of uh, then conceptual frameworks those labels uh, uh, sort of uh, signify or, or even, even sometimes hide behind them. And, 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 and I was just thinking in terms of this, this as you brought it up, that, that it might sometimes be very difficult. So, Maybe the question in my mind is that does or would uh, the, the, the more careful examination and, 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 and of, of different cases, let's say Islamic popular music, help us in some way to go beyond these, these kind of very rigid, sometimes very rigid classifications that we have in our mind about uh, not music, only music, but also the, the the whole whole kind of a question of this is that when does popular music? Oh, when we talk about pop music here, why is the counterpart somehow the religious one? So, that, or would it be more sensible some some sometimes to sort of think that okay, that distinction between religious music and popular music it, it doesn't make really sense. So that they can be music can be both popular and religious at the same time, and and then then also to think about further not not maybe. So, so this, this related also to, to the, some of the discussion, I think, especially in Ihan's paper about the questions of authenticity and, and, and that, that how how authenticity sometimes is, is, is becomes uh, a kind of a there's an invention in a sense uh, involved that, that authenticity becomes the crew, uh, the core value that you have to have authenticity somewhere and if you don't in a sense in a kind of traditional way have it, then it, it must be manufactured in a way. I, don't, I, I know that I didn't say this, but this is, this is the kind of a, uh, 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 way that authenticity itself becomes almost a religious-like aspect of, of making music and, and maybe making, making or doing, uh, doing culture in more in general. So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm basically, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm trying to formulate here a question around that, that, that is there a way of going beyond or, or, or does this, this or to what extent is this distinction between especially popular music versus uh, religious music or, or well religious secular is it, is it meaningful always uh, do we have examples that, that, that sort of go against this, this kind of a rather rigid uh, separation between those fields, and it might. Oh, is it? Is it just? Do we? Do we have these labels so that it would be more or easier in, in, for people to to well to use them in the in the marketplace? In the sense of, do we have a kind of a uh, economic imperative there somewhere, 
behind of this, that we need to have these labels to stick onto these, these, these different types of activity that we have and, and then not think about it any, any further. I don't know if this makes sense now, but yeah. Mm. <laughs> do, you, do you want to comment on this? I can, I can comment one, my experience that uh, when we play this kind of music, of course, some people are very strict that how she should sound and how it, how it should be played. And it is like, if you make something a little bit modern or something, then they get angry. So, that, for example, for me, is I don't understand that kind of logic. So, if I like something and do something else with it, why it is forbidden? So, it's like the one you say, but uh, it's also one of the other side of the religion is rebelling. You just rebel the life and then you demand better life, so that kind of stuff. So you, it's also included the life, so somebody resists and then you rebel. It's my experience, I don't know, it's there. There is a parallel, of course, and I think you have it in the back of your mind with world music. Um, when you have religious music, it's very often marketed as religious music. So, so there is an emic dimension, there is an, an idea that we want to market ourselves as religious because we are marketing as a counterculture product. Uh, this is to be consumed instead of something else. And that has then been taken over by researchers and the problem is, of course, what do we reproduce when we reproduce actual categories instead of using academic categories and, and try to use them analytically and, and then we sort of take categories from the actual game and use them analytically. And then we end up with, with things like the discussion of world music, how, how music, suddenly certain music is supposed to be world music but other music is not supposed to be world music, and why is it so? And of course it's the same thing here. And uh, it it's even goes straight into the, the actual categories uh, of the things that I'm studying. You have the idea of fan and hadith, which basically means purposeful art, which is explicitly religious music, and the idea is very, very much like um, the Marxist discussion of culture. Art is supposed to propel people into action not sort of a nihilistic bourgeoisie uh, art for art's sake. Uh, but then again, the same people also elaborate with a category that they call fan nadif, clean art, which is really in the middle. It basically means do away with the lyrics that says that drinking and dating and having sex is fun, and sing clean lyrics. So, what I didn't mention is that the company that I, I'm looking at has now signed its first artist who does not sing religious songs. Simply popular music with clean lyrics. So what are we then talking about? Are we talking about religious music? Because it's motivated. The lack of, of sexualized and, and drunk romantic lyrics is motivated by a religious ethos, but it doesn't say anything about religion whatsoever. It rather thinks about the positive thing about smiling. And we're really and we're really in the borderline, aren't we? I suppose I should say something. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. There's this issue with world music. I mean the we now have the internet, we have a lot of travel, we have a lot of connections, and is everything going to start sounding the same? And there's a kind of, I've traveled a lot, and I like the fact that you go to some country and things smell different and sound different, and are we sort of entering a time when we'll just have a homogeneous soup everywhere? But on the other hand, you know, when we're saying that this is a tradition, this is authentic, at its time it was probably considered some kind of fusion, and we put sort of lines in the sand or stick flags and say, well, you know, this is, this is the real deal, and when you combine it with something else, it's not. As far as religious music's concerned, uh, 
What do you say, Mona? You were a believer but not practicing. So I'm a non-believer who practices. We <laughs> <laughs> um, have a good cup. <laughs> <laughs> we get on well. <laughs> but, well, I don't know, those who saw the presentation, I mean, I'm looking for direct experiencing. The first musical experience that I would consider a religious experience was when I was about 14 years old and I was playing the Beethoven septet, which I don't think is that religious. Um, but it was one of those kind of flow experiences. So I, it was, I was playing up to that point in pretty bad school orchestras, then suddenly playing with the best musicians in a chamber music group. And it was just so blissful, it was just amazing. You know, everything was in tune and working well, and then, you know, just the music just happened. I was gone, there was just music. And I've had that experience with these guys sometimes. Uh, I consider that legitimate religious experience without... Uh, without really needing any belief. So I don't know how that fitted that question, but anyway, I'll just add that to the equation. So. <laughs> so, any, any, any questions, comments uh, uh, from the audience? Points? I mean, you people in the audience, you, you should be sitting here, not, not in there. What's going on here? I mean, although yeah, it seems that we have to wrap things up in, in five or so minutes. So, um, um, I think there's something else that I really wanted to, to say before we... Okay. Yeah. 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 Hey, I'm Jenna Hipakka, and I'm Jyväskylän Yliopiston musiikkikasvatuksen opiskelija. Kirjoitan parhaillaan gradua aiheesta, joka käsittelee moniuskontoisuuden haasteita ja mahdollisuuksia musiikin opettajan työssä. Ja olisi mielenkiintoista kuulla kommentti siihen, että... Can you do this in English? No, you have to translate. You do it in Finnish. Jos nyt ensin kerran mun kysymyksen, niin pysyn itsekin perässä, koska tämä... Tuota, toi paljon ajatuksia. Äh, siis mua kiinnostaa jotenkin se, että, että millaisia ajatuksia teillä on siihen, että peruskoulun opetus ylipäätään on toki tunnustuksetonta, mutta siihen musiikin opetukseen usein liittyy ristiriitoja, koska, koska musi, musiikki perinteessämme on kuitenkin myös se hengellisyyttä ja Esimerkiksi tästä suvivirrestä on ollut paljon keskustelua, saako sitä laulaa keväällä. Ja sitten moniuskontoisissa kouluissa ylipäätään ö, tulisi olla tarkka siitä, että, että mitä siellä musiikkiluokassa lauletaan ja miten huomioidaan eri uskontojen ö, lähestymistapoja. Ö, tota, Mikäli sait tästä nyt jotain kiinni, niin haluaisin kuulla tähän jotain kommenttia, että onko musiikki ikään kuin pyhää ja voiko äh, kristitty laulaa esimerkiksi äh, islamilaisia lauluja vain oppiakseen heidän musiikkityylistään tai muuta vastaavaa. So, hi, my name is Jenna Hiipakka. I'm studying in University of Jyväskylä. And I'm now writing my master thesis and I'm studying music education. So my topic is um, <laughs> how can I say this in English? What's up? Yeah. 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 Yeah, the question of the several ones, but no, uh, is about uh, the the, the uh, significance of of uh, uh, religious diversity in music teaching, and uh, uh, how does this affect, uh, uh, for example, the example was here that uh, how does it uh, connect and, and 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 is interrelated to the kind of. Uh, spiritual traditions in, in, in the local context, for example in Finland, that there are certain songs, certain hymn-based songs that are supposed to be sung in every every 
uh, school fest and uh, feast and so forth. And how how do we take into account different approaches coming from different religion? Is music sacred in a sense, or or can a Christian person, for example, sing Islamic songs just in order to learn from their musical style? Okay, so that that would be the the, the, the group of questions there. So do you? Well, well, let's let's start start with this this question. That how does the uh, religious diversity? What is what is in your opinion its its significance and, and centrality in, in the music music education circles? Do you have any, any comments on this? <laughs> Group member. I, I teach engineering students power systems. <laughs> 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 I would say why not? You know I think it's interesting in my life when it's come to this kind of um, I don't know what's what's fashionable or politically correct. When I was young, the idea was to be colorblind, and that is to not take in account of anybody's cultural background. For example, I come from New Zealand, and, and that was the thinking. You came there and you treated everybody the same. You didn't sort of make any... And now we have multiculturalism where you should really take account of people's background. Actually, that's more widespread, not just because somebody's from a different country or culture, but any individual know there's a story behind them. But in my, from my point of view, and it's a little bit maybe radical, I, I think it's an accident what religion you've got. It depends mostly on where you're born and how you're brought up. Um, and I would say, yeah, if you're going to uh, do one songs from one religion in a music class, try and get in as many other ones as you can as well. I mean, uh, and but that's you know that's that's. That's an engineer who doesn't have to worry about those things in the classroom situation talking. So I realize, you know, I mean, I, I'm wanting society to move on and, and to sort of really re celebrate the diversity, you know, not get stuck up. And there was one thing I didn't mention there. There was a guy called Dos Carlos, uh, a teacher from southern Cyprus. Uh, sorry, what was his name? Uh, the, he was called the Magus of Strovolos. He was a Christian mystic anyway. And he said that you have to tend to the flowers in your garden and really appreciate them, but you have to really also appreciate the flowers in your neighbor's garden and realize that they're just as important to them. Uh, now we're talking about sort of stepping into each other's gardens and sort of practicing and singing. It's complicated, it's really complicated, and, and you've got the reality of teacher, uh, parents and people with a lot of cultural baggage behind them, and you know, often the problem in the class is not the students, but um, the home situation they're coming from, whether it's in Finland or whether it's from a first-generation migrant community. Challenging stuff. No great answer, but I would try to move beyond not being able to sing a Sufi song in a, in a, you know, maybe in a cultural context that's predominantly Christian, or vice versa, try and find what's universal in it. The other stuff's circumstantial and relative. I don't have a good answer. Um, but there are some researchers uh, who do, not exactly what you were asking for, but uh, asking really interesting questions about music in classrooms. And one of them is, is here in Finland. Uh, her name is Alexis Kalil, and she passed her PhD like half a year ago, something like that. Do you know the title of it? I do, but I can't remember it. But if basically, she, she investigates music teachers and the practice of music as power games, and, and who, what, what does this actually mean to play songs? Can you bring in? popular music into the classroom, what does that mean? And it all points to the fact that uh, sound escapes and, and taking space with sound, taking time with sound, is connected with power and domination and representation. And since it is, it becomes really complex. When you classify music as mine, theirs, uh, evil, good, etc., almost all music will in one way or another be dragged into it. And if you're a minority, you're very likely to classify music like that. And also the majority will not see their own classification, but they will have a power praxis.
through songs, so or popular music, or whatever, what have you. And if you look at the Swedish researcher Jenny Berglund, uh, she did her research in Muslim uh, private schools in Sweden, and parts of what she's writing about is music teaching. And there they use a lot of the uh, the new Muslim pop music uh, as Muslim pride. They sing it with the kids, they, they print the lyrics, they listen to the artists, they read about them, just in similar fashion that you might end up doing in, in music teaching, that you read about your idols and, and you make a short presentation about Iron Maiden or whatever, what have you. Uh, the, these are drawn into that circle and, and there is a certain amount of pride. And because of its pride, it's also about power. But I don't have a better answer than that. Else? Yeah, I think uh, it's a it's an interesting area, and uh, um, what you said there about the question that is is music sacred. Uh, I think that in some ways, in those discussions, it seems that, that there's this, this one thing that well, I, I, I should go back to my introduction in the morning about the one revelation that when I when I started first reading about the, the kind of intricate or the, the, the relationship between music and Islam and, and, and the problems there was this idea or the, the, as I mentioned that that it, it kind of one of the revelations personal revelations was to me that it helped me to, to question music to begin with that, that that what we call music is not always so so clear cut that, that there are different ways of defining music and when I as a as a, as a person who's gone through the Western education system talk about music it doesn't doesn't mean that it's music for everybody, and then also in, in, in different different. And I, I, it, it sort of reminded me also that music is a loan word in Finnish language. We didn't know about music until uh, the 16th century or so. So everything before that was something else. So uh, so in that sense, we don't don't know what music is, and and, and then it becomes part of this power place in, in in one way or another. The other revelation was this idea that uh, there is this this. And it, it sort of links to the kind of stuff that I already read before, coming from the Central European philosophical tradition and a critical theory, and especially Theodor Adorno's work, a German philosopher who worked within the music field. Uh, and the idea that music has has power, or music mu music is always implicated in, in power in one way or another. And that, that, that also here, the question that is music sacred, that there is this tendency to invest music. I don't know if it if it has to do with the with the with the fact. This also links to the stuff that we talked earlier on about the the way in which we, we make sense about the world through verbal means. In many cases. So when there is a communicative system, a symbolic system like music that doesn't use words, it makes us uncomfortable in a sense. And and, and that it makes also it easier to, to invest that phenomenon with, with different kind of meanings and, and power, power relations that, that we, we don't have necessarily the, the words to describe it and, and not, not the pictures even or so forth and the kind of a more explicit ways of explaining how we are. This links especially to, to John's paper about this, this kind of experiencing and, 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 and the, the kind of nonverbal aspects there. But in that sense, it also makes music in my other idea that I have here is that to emphasize that that, that makes music so powerful in, in these situations that it can be invested in, in so many different ways that, that are not maybe so uh, easily explainable. And, and then, then it, it sort of borders on the, on the aspects of the religious, not in terms of the religious ideology or the tenets themselves, but rather as a kind of a similar, similar um, a cognitive structure, in a sense, that, that, that the way in which we see, or well, we do not see music, or sometimes we do, sometimes, or more, more often, I think that we hear and listen to it, but still, that, uh, that we understand music, that it, 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 in a sense, fundamentally, or this kind of a, well, organically, in a way, is closer to the way in which we also approach religion. I'm not sure if this is, this is, this is always so, but I think that there's a certain, certain kind of similarity there. And that makes music in, in many ways a very kind of a... Um, that it, 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 yeah, I would, I, would, I would agree on that, that 
or, or be in favor of the interpretation that it's in a way very easily invested with these sacred uh, 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 qualities that, that in a way it's it, because it's, it's, it's not so easily explainable and that also kind of is an is a, is a allegory towards the kind of a, uh, religious ways of, of, of seeing the world. May I add a little to that? I'm sorry, we have to finish. Okay. Was it? Oh, I can make it very short. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the Islamic uh, idea about it is that everyone agrees, everyone agrees that music is powerful in Islamic writing. Everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Then, then, the then there is basically three positions. Either it's powerful because it's part of the universe, it's the part of the original design. If we can take that original design and make it into worldly music, we make heavenly music like the angels sing. That's why it's powerful. Or it's created by Satan to divert people from religion. That's why it's powerful. And then you have another position. It's powerful because it rhymes with the human humors. It makes us emotional, it makes us soft at the heart, and it makes us intelligent, and it makes us want to go towards God. But it's, it's part of the structure. Those, those three versions always circulate around. But everyone agrees that it's powerful. But if it's good or bad, that's another thing. <laughs> no one says that music is meaningless and has no power over, me, over people. Yeah, exactly. This was the, the second revelation, if it sort of, I didn't express myself clearly enough there. Okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, and then once again, thank you for the presenters and Murat uh, and everybody else. And special thanks, of course, to the store of personal questions, especially who, who made, made this happen as much as anybody else. Yep, yep, good. Thank you. And now, time for the concert in five or six minutes.